Thank you. I'm glad someone is excited for scary things. <laughs> uh, so I work for Big Nerd Ranch, and most people know us from our, our books and our training classes, but we actually spend most of our employees, most of our engineers spend most of their time doing app development on a consulting basis. And this talk comes out of a internal Swift summit, let's get everybody exploring Swift, because we have a lot of very experienced Objective-C programmers, right? Lots of people who are familiar with Perform Selector, and many fewer who are familiar with Reduce and Fold and Map. Right, so this, this is where that came from. Um, we'll talk some about monads, and then bring up some topics that came up uh, throughout the day, which seems to be a recurring theme. So some people use analogies like a monad is a burrito, a monad is a genie in a bottle, a monad is a box. I think maybe the more apt one in some ways is that a monad is kind of like Voldemort. Um, <laughs> in the sense that like nobody wants to give it a name because if you do, everybody around you starts talking like this. Right, if you, if you bring this up on, so. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna not do that because um, this is useless to me and probably most of you if you're not a category theorist. So instead, let's say that maybe if, if you could define a monad protocol on Swift, which you can't, Andy touched on this last time, um, this is the kind of thing it would look like. So all, all a monad is is a type that has two things. You can create one with some value, and it has this bind function that, like I said, this is not valid Swift code. You can't write this. So we're going to talk about some concrete types that actually implement this function. Particular optional is a monad. You're already using it. You just don't realize it un unless you know, you've had this conversation before. And it is already defined, right? You can create an optional from a value. That's, that's, that's fine. Bind can be implemented like this, given a closure that takes a T and to some new optional U. So say we want to take a, say T is an int, right? We have an optional int. We can call bind on it, give it a closure that takes a non-optional int and returns an optional of some other type, say a string. And then bind itself returns an optional string. So what this does is if the optional is nil, we just return nil. We don't even call the closure. If it's not nil, we call the closure and return that. Right? This, is, this is optional chaining. Right? I'm just giving it a name called bind. Andy mentioned map. This is already defined in the Swift standard library. The return value is exactly the same. Just like bind, it takes a closure. The only difference is that f, in this case, returns a, a concrete u, not an optional u. So that's the only difference here. I'm going to flip back to the previous slide. Look at the signature of bind, f takes a t to an optional u, and in map, f takes a t to a u. Other, other than that, they're exactly the same. And you can implement map in terms of bind and init. All right. So let's talk about result. Natasha brought this up earlier. Um, let's dive into some more details. This is the way result is defined in some languages where you have, you can make it generic, right? Maybe you have a concrete case where you want an NS error as a failure and a, any object as a success. But in Swift, we've got generic, so in theory, we can make this generic over both types. Unfortunately, this doesn't compile at the moment. Um, we'll talk about that more in a minute. <coughs> uh, so instead, we'll do this. We often want the error type to be consistent. Right? So if you've got two functions that both have results of something, it is very handy for them to have the same error. So in this case, I'm going to define results. I've got some GitHub repositories that you need to look at, I'll link to at the end of the talk, and this is how result is defined in them. Um, you have success, some type T, and a failure of an error type, which is just some protocol. NS error might conform to this. You could write your own error structures or classes that conform to this. And there are a couple links here for discussion. So LlamaKit also defines a result type, and there was a lot of discussion recently, maybe even still ongoing, about how to label these things, what should the cases be, what should we do with our error types. I also want to bring up Rust, um, because they have recently done a lot of overhauling of their result and error handling stuff to make things more consistent across different libraries and APIs. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in Rust as well. Um, unfortunately, this also does not compile in the current Swift compiler. You have to box up the T value in some way. Uh, the way that I took uh, when I was working on this stuff earlier this summer was to wrap it up in a closure. You could also wrap it up in a box class. A bunch of you have probably seen that in some of the other open source projects that are out there. Okay, so we have this result. Natasha showed earlier, you get a result out, you can then do a switch statement for success and failure. That's sort of heavyweight. We can pull this down into bind. That's, that's all that this bind function does. Given some f 
that's going to take our success type t and return a new result of type u, we can, inside the bind function, we switch. If, if we currently have a successful value, then we'll call the closure that was supplied and return that. If we have a failure, we're not going to call the closure. There's nothing we can do. We don't have a t to give it, right? f is expecting an argument of type t, but we don't have one because we're in the error case. We're just going to chain the error through, right? So what this ends up doing is you have this sort of train track behavior where if you have several calls in succession, each of which might fail in a different way, you can, using bind and map, you can code the happy path. And if any one of them fails, it just short circuits. None of the rest of them get called. You just pass, you just chain the, the failures through. So this, this image is from uh, this F Sharp for Fun and Profit article. Coming back to the Voldemort idea, there's actually a, a blog post on this where he says, I'm not going to use the word monad because it's so off-putting. So this entire article is all about monads, but never actually uses the word. He calls it railway-oriented programming. Because that's, that's the idea that you've got, just like a train track, right? You can detour at any point and, and short circuit the rest of your trip. If anything fails, you, don't, you can't go forward anymore. You just got to skip straight to the failure case. So what does this look like in praxis? Say we have two functions. The first one, read string, takes a socket and returns the result string. Right, so reading from a socket might fail for any number of reasons. In the successful case, we get back a string. Great. In the failure case, you know, we get back some error of some unknown kind. We have a sec second function, parse message. So we're expecting, you know, messages of a particular format to come over the socket. So we're going to take a string as input and try to parse it, return a result of type message. So if we can parse it successfully, we'll do that and return a, you know, a new message type. If we can't, we'll return some failure. Now we want to combine those, right? So those two functions by themselves are somewhat easier to design and test. You could imagine how they're implemented, right? The read, so the read string thing doesn't have to be concerned with whatever bytes are coming. It just has to read bytes off the socket. And the parse message doesn't have anything to do with networking. It's just working on strings. So those are both easier to implement when you isolate them like that. And then we can combine them with bind, right? So we have a string result. We call read string on the socket. We then use that string results bind method bind the parse message function. So at this point, both error cases are handled via bind. If read string fails, parse message is never going to get called. The bind is just going to pass that failure through. If read string succeeds, then we'll call parse message and get the result of that, either success or failure. Okay. Let's, let's switch and talk about asynchronous stuff uh, for just a minute. We'll come back to results shortly. So deferred is a library for doing asynchronous programming. It's very similar to a promise or a future. Probably a bunch of people, yeah, everybody's nodding in their heads. You know what this is. Um, deferred, the name and the API come from an OCaml library that's put out by Jane Street. Um, they have a bunch of interesting stuff on their blog and videos. Um, Yaron Minsky, in particular, has a lot of really good talks about um, using strong types to make your programs less buggy. So deferred is coming from them. So this is a, a short overview of some of the things that it has in it. You can create a deferred that's initially empty. That makes sense. I have something that I'm going to fill in later in some asynchronous way. You, have a, you can create one that already has a value in it. This will be useful to us later. But what that's saying is I have, I have something that's technically deferred, but I already know what the value is going to be. So I can just create one immediately. You can ask, does this, is this thing filled or not? You can fill it with a value, assuming it's currently empty. You can peek and say, what is the value if there is one? And then upon says, once this thing is filled, run this block, run this closure. Right? Or run it immediately if, if the thing already has a value in it. Okay? Um, deferred is open source as of yesterday. I in theory, it is the, the nice thing about it is it's perfectly thread safe. So it uses locks internally. So you can call any properties or methods from any thread at the same time, and that's OK. I look forward to when Fox has asynchronous support, so I can see if that's actually true. Uh, but for now, we'll just hope that it is. Hope that the you know the, the simple tests work okay. Um, okay, so the cool thing about deferred, the other cool thing, is that it is also a monad. So we can bind. We have we have a deferred value. We can bind another function that's going to take the result of that first deferred whenever it gets filled and run some other function that's also asynchronous. 
right? We might, we might want to chain together two reads of a socket. That's fine. We can do that with bind. And map, again, the same thing. The only difference is, just like in the optional case, the only difference is the return value of the closure that we're passing. But other than that, they work the same way. The idea is we have this deferred. Once it gets filled, run this closure on the, on the value that was filled in. All right? So just like I had with the result, we can have an example of this. So we have a function connect over TCP that takes a host name. That's going to return a deferred socket because that's a blocking operation, right? It's going to take some time to actually open that connection. We have another function, handshake, that takes an already established socket and returns a deferred connection. This is going to you know, send a hello, I'm so-and-so, wait for the server to respond. OK, that's cool. You can log in now. And then we want to combine these together. So we have connect, which is going to take a string and return a deferred connection. We're just going to wrap up the socket. So this code looks exactly the same as result did earlier, right? We call connect over TCP and get back a deferred socket. And then we can bind that to the handshake function, which takes the socket once that connection has been established and runs the handshake function, and we get back a deferred connection, right? The problem with this slide is that it's assuming that these operations always succeed. Right? Deferred socket says eventually you're going to get a socket, but that may not happen if the host doesn't exist or he's you know, being DDoSed and not responding to your request, for example. So instead, what we actually end up needing to do is have deferred result socket. So I heard you like monads. Let's put some monads in your monads and go from there. <laughs> <coughs> um, but we have a problem now. So we have connect over TCP, which takes a host, returns a deferred result socket, that's fine, we can, that makes sense, right? Eventually we're gonna get either a successful socket or failure of some kind. Handshake takes a socket, returns a deferred result connection, that makes sense because the server might you know, be speaking the wrong protocol, that might fail. Then we go to write the connect function, so now we wanna chain these things together. We have a host, we want a deferred result of a connection, so all right, we'll call the first one, connect over TCP, and then what? Because you can't, there's no combination of bind or map that makes sense to put on that bottom line. The types don't match up. Um, we'll come back to that idea of the types not matching up in a few minutes. So what we need is called a monad transformer. All right. So we have a monad within a monad. Without like digging into the code, what, what we want makes sense, right? We have a deferred result if that thing, once that thing finishes, if it's successful, we want to move on and run the next step, right? That's what, that's what we want to happen. And that's what this code is doing, particularly the success path, right? That, that part makes sense. If we have, so imagine T is socket from the previous slide, right? If we have a successful socket value, we want to run this closure that's associated with it, pass it the socket, and we get back a deferred result of a connection or something like that. The only part that's a little tricky, and this is why the monad transformer is necessary, is the failure case, right? If, the, if, it, if we fail opening a socket, technically, we still are supposed to return a deferred result of a connection. So we need to wrap up the failure in deferred. This is why we have an initializer for deferred to say, just create one, but you don't have to wait. I already know what the value is. The whole thing failed. I can't even attempt to handshake because I don't have a socket to handshake on. So now that we have result to defer the monad transformer, we can go back to this example and use it. So now that has the right type signature. We can create a function with the right type signature to pass to bind. So we have this result to deferred of the, so dollar zero there is a result socket, right? That's what was inside the deferred. And then we're going to bind that to the handshake function. So when I first started playing with this, and some of my colleagues who looked at this code were like, well, you know, the type, the compiler knows these types, but this whole bind map monad transformer stuff, you cannot get it wrong, right? That's like the best thing about this. If you get it wrong, it won't compile, right? Like you can't, you can't mess up. It, it, the type system guarantees that you're going to call these things in the right order. You can't accidentally call bind when you meant to call map because it's, it's a type error, right? It doesn't make any sense, which is fantastic. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to advocate. So like in teaching, particularly when we were teaching Objective-C and we talk about pointers, sometimes you have a student that's like, I think I'm just going to add an ampersand or an asterisk until this thing compiles. I'm like, no, 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 you can't. 
And so I'm not exactly advocating, you know, I just try binary map, you know, one of them's gonna work. That's a lot safer to do here than it was back in C, right? Because there really is only one that's gonna work and you're gonna know at compile time which one was the right one to call. So on the topic of integrating with teammates who are used to Objective-C, so deferred, so this, is, this is new and foreign, I'm not sure I like this. So we can make some easy comparisons to completion blocks, which is what people are used to from Objective-C, right? If you, ha if you write a, a function that returns a deferred and the person who's using it doesn't want to use any of this monad stuff, that's fine. They can call upon and basically then it's just a completion block, right? Upon fulfillment of this deferred, run this block, run this closure. And there are flavors of it to control like what GCDQ you're on, that sort of thing. But this is where we say, oh, there's some sugar, right? You come along, come along for the ride and you get some powerful things. You can, you can combine deferreds in interesting ways. So if you have two deferreds, you can write a generic function here, both, that's gonna wait for both of them to complete. And then you get both results at the same time. I know personally, I've committed the grave sin of state Boolean flags, like multiple Boolean flags in my view controller, right? I'm waiting for you know, this network request to complete and I'm waiting for this asynchronous iOS thing to load from core data. So I've got a bool for the first one and a bool for the second one and every time I set one of them, I gotta check if they're both true and then I finally do the thing, right? And that, that's like bad enough when it's two and then you add a third one and you just go home crying, right? Um, so with this sort of thing, you can, you can take care of that at the, at the asynchronous level. It's like, okay, here's a run this, instead of having a completion block that runs for each one and I have to check all the state, you can say, here's my first thing, here's my second thing, but I don't actually care about either of them individually, I care about both of them when they're both done. You can also do, you can combine them in other ways. These three are all implemented, I'm sure there are other interesting things you could do as well. All takes an array of deferreds and returns a deferred array, right? Once all of these things complete, give me back the entire array of all the results. Cool. Any, it's the same, it's sort of the opposite. Given an array of deferreds, give me back the first one that gets filled. I, I don't care about the rest, just, I just care about the first one that gets done. All right. So now I wanna talk about deferred TCP socket, which is also available as of yesterday, um, but is, I, I will make fewer claims on its uh, suitability for production code, let's put it that way. Um, it is very much an experiment um, we have, a, we have a client that we use. The vast majority of work, I'm sure much like you guys, is web services and JSON and all that fun business, but we do still have at least one client that we need to talk raw TCP um, for some reason. And we've used uh, Coco Async Socket in the past. Has anybody used Coco Async Socket before? A couple hands, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a nice Objective-C library, but this was an experiment to say, how can we use Swift and you know pull ideas from OCaml in particular and, and express TCP communication in a higher level way. So this TCP, deferred TCP socket uses the low level C APIs, you know, get adder name, get sock name, all that stuff, get adder info. Um, it, it sits on top of GCD's dispatch sources for async IO, um, which is another C based thing. Both of those are super annoying to use from Swift. Um, uh, the, the most egregious, if anybody's done socket level programming in C, you know you have this struct sock adder, which is the thing for like, I need to look up the IP address of this host. Well that, like in libc, the way that's defined assumes it's fine to alias between pointers of different types. Like that's how it's written, it, it assumes that works. Swift really doesn't like that sort of thing. But given enough use of you know unsafe pointer casting, you can make it work correctly. Um, so we'll go back, somebody mentioned earlier the idea of you gotta write ugly stuff but wrap it up, right? That's what's going on here. Underneath, we're still using all these error prone C APIs, but we can wrap it up at a higher level. So we have an accept socket. This is for the server side. Um, connection handler is a type alias just for a tuple of a, a GCD queue and a callback function. So the way, if nobody, if you haven't written a TCP server before, the way that works is you start listening on some port and whenever someone connects, you get a new socket that's just used for that connection, right? So this connection handler says, whenever you get a new socket, run the callback function on this GCD queue. 
right? And then we have this class func accept, which is sort of the entry point. Start listening on this port and run this connection handler whenever someone connects to it. This returns a result accept socket, so starting to accept is not a blocking operation. We can, we can start that up immediately, but some other process might be listening on the port we want to listen on. This might fail. We might not be able to create a socket. Right? There are still failure cases for this. We get a result back. On the client side, we have a TCP communication socket. So it has a connect to hosts, give it some hosts and some service report like HTTP or 80. Um, we get back a deferred, because this is going to block, you know, result of the communication socket. So it's an asynchronous operation that might fail. Once we have one, a successful TCP comm socket, we can read data from it. That's, again, a blocking operation that might fail. So we have a deferred result in S data. Um, the, the real class has other variants, like read data to delimiter, read data to byte length, that sort of stuff. Um, read data is fine for the slides. And then write data is the same thing. This is, you know, I want to I send data to the guy I'm connected to. The return type is a little interesting here. Deferred result of nothing. This is because if, if the right, remember the, the result type there is the success case, right? If the right succeeds, that, that's all we care about. It succeeded. There's no useful information that can be returned there. So somebody looked at this code and said, well, why don't you just have deferred bool? Because the result still has the failure case that has an error message associated with it, right? You might care what, why did my right fail, right? And you can inspect the failure case to know, to learn why. All right, so let's look at uh, an example. Two of my least favorite words in programming are just and simple. Now I'll combine them both into one slide. Just a simple handshake. The client is going to send a hello packet with a username. The server is going to respond with OK, and then we have a connection. So this is a, uh, imagine this is sort of a dummy IRC, um, and there's sample code for this. You can pull this up and run the server on, there's a Mac server and an iOS client that you can play with. So. Let's look at just the client side. This is what's actually happening. Right? We have to do a DNS lookup of the server's host name. Then we have to create a socket. We have to actually establish the connection. We have to write our packet. We have to read the response of the packet. And then we have to parse that and confirm that it actually contains the response we expect. All right. So just to be clear, these things are all blocking operations. And we have to like, wait for them sequentially. And these things, which is all of them, might fail. <laughs> Right, um, so I think I think what did Justin call this the uh, essential complex complexity of the TCP IP stack and drop packets and blah blah blah. Right, that's what this is. Right. So I, I think a bunch of people saw this tweet, and this is the point. Right, even something as simple as handshaking with a server, which you do you know hundreds of times during your day, is complicated. Right, it is it is a difficult thing to do. And we're going to look at how functional ideas can help, but it's just a complicated thing. Right? OK, so let's see how we can use these deferred result ideas from earlier and implement this handshake. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show these helper functions and squeeze a ton of code onto the next slide. And I apologize now that it's going to be really dense, but it's the best I could do to fit on the slide. So we have a connect function, takes a host name, returns a deferred result of a comm socket. Fine, that's our initial connection. We have a parse message, which is going to take some data that presumably we've read off the socket and try to parse it into a message that we understand. And then we have a confirm handshake response that takes the message and returns either an empty result, which means it succeeded, it is the handshake we expected, or it's a failure of some kind, like the server sent us a goodbye message instead of a hello message or something like that. All right. Now, what's, yeah, again, I'm sorry. Um, so at the very top, we have, what we want to do is connect and handshake. So given some host name, we don't, we don't want to return this to our caller until we know that the connection has been completely established, right? So we're going to return defer deferred result of the socket, but only once we know that the handshake is complete. So the first thing we're going to do is connect. That's fine. That gives us, from the previous slide, a deferred result of the socket. Right. Can, I, I'm just going to kind of sort of skip over these bind and result to deferred and map, right, for the most part, because they're just, 
the sort of nesting that we need to process through the asynchronous code, right? So if we get down to step two, that socket variable there means the connection, the asynchronous call is complete and it was successful, we have a socket. So at that point, we can write our hello packet, send the, the server, here's, here's, here's who I am, I want to connect to you. Again, we do the little bind result to deferred dance in this case, remember, write doesn't return anything useful if it succeeds. So we don't, that's where the parentheses n comes in, which is, I think, technically unnecessary, but it's there for illustration. So by the time we get to step three, that means the connection succeeded, we have a socket, and we successfully wrote our packet, right? The write succeeded. Now we'll, we'll call map. Again, this is just to get all the types to line up correctly. We have a data result, which is, sorry, read data dot map, which is saying, read the server's response, right? Then the, the very bottom, we're going to try, we're gonna go bind bind map, which again is this result train track, right? If we get to this point, we have some, we maybe, we have either success or failure of a read. So we will bind that to parse the message. If there's data there, try to parse it into a message. Bind that to our confirm handshake, so if, there's data and we parsed a message, see if it's the right thing. And if you remember from the previous slide, that just returns result of nothing, right? All it says is, is there a successful result? But what we actually wanna return at the end of the day is the socket. So we'll map that empty result into the socket, all right? So I showed this to uh, a colleague. Uh, the response was much like the snickers I'm hearing in the audience. It's like, this is, you're telling me this is better? Uh, yes, and this is why. This, granted, the slide is dense, and you wouldn't actually write it exactly like this, but it's it's pretty close to what you would what you would really write probably. All the error handling is here, right? It's all there, but there's no if error, if no, if yes, if else. All you don't have to do any of that, right? And you don't even need to do the sort of heavyweight switch statement to unpack result at any level. Right, with the, with the result binding, we just get to pass through. All we write is the happy path, right? Connect, and then send the handshake, and then read the response. We have to sprinkle in bind and map and result to deferred, which makes the code dense and hard to read at first. But by the, by the, it will take you, it'll take you more time to read this slide than it would that many lines of objective C. But if you are writing this in objective C, it's gonna be you know, five times as long and scattered over like five different delegate methods. Right? or a bunch of different completion blocks that all get errors back. So my argument to him was, yes, this is much more dense. It's gonna take you a lot more time to read this code than you think it would take to read the same amount of Objective-C, but it's a lot less code. And when you get to the end, you're more sure that all your error cases are handled, right? Because in this case, the type system is handling them all for you. You know that result is gonna pass the error through. In the Objective-C case, imagine this is scattered, again, over five different delegate methods. You have to go and check each one Okay, if I get the error here, does it correctly sort of short circuit the right behavior and pass the error back to my caller? Right, you've got logic scattered all over the place. So yes, this is better, in my opinion. <laughs> right, so the topic has come up today, and I'm sure everybody has thought this before, that Swift being such a new language, it doesn't have idioms yet, right? There's there's the machine translation style, and there's the Swift ML style, and there's everything in between. Um, but for now, we can you know, happily steal ideas from these other languages, and then try to pick and choose which one of these makes sense to introduce to our coworkers and to our libraries. Um, use the functional programming techniques when it makes sense. So I, result is in enough other languages that I feel confident in saying that is the way we should be handling errors. And I hope that once the Swift compiler compiles result, they'll include it in the standard library, right? Like right now there's probably six different open source implementations of result, which is a total disaster for any number of reasons. Really that should just be part of the standard library and they should be giving that to us. We should never use NS error pointer pointer in Swift. If you're calling, if you're calling functions like that, because you're calling Objective-C and those exist, wrap it up in a result like right there at the call site and just use that throughout the rest of your Swift code. Um, here are a few links. The, the GitHub repos are all under Big Nerd Ranch, uh, Git repository. And then once you're done reading Real World Haskell and Elm, go read Real World OCaml as well. It's also excellent. <laughs> I 
that's it for me. Any questions? Can I explain the auto closure for the result? Sure. Um, yeah, I should probably have done this differently. Uh, do you want to know why or what it is, or both? Okay. <coughs> okay. So the why is the I'm not I'm not a compiler implementation guy, but judging from the error message that we get back from the Swift compiler, because result is the compiler doesn't know what the size of T is, and it doesn't know what the size of error type is, and it cannot currently handle an enum with multiple unsized or unknown size cases. Okay, so by putting the auto closure in there, that is now the size of a pointer because all closures are references. So now the size of the success case is just the size of a single pointer to a closure. Uh, box is probably a safer Alternative, I think that, that's the one that um, LlamaKit uses uh, for a couple of reasons that don't matter too much, uh, but auto closure is what I've used. Uh, so the final result that you got to, um, uh, kind of you're building a pyramid there, right? It leads to pyramid code. Yeah. Do you see any way of getting rid of that, like Facebook does with vaults, for example, which is kind of similar to, to this principle, I would say? Yeah, you can. So the, you're talking about the very last slide or the next last slide? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. The question was, we have, uh, I'll, I'll paraphrase, we have this really bad rightward drift, right? We've got nested, 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 nested thing, right? Um, you can, I don't think there's any silver bullet for that. Um, you could, if, if you were not writing these as inline closures, if they were like actual functions in their own right, you wouldn't have this, this problem wouldn't be as bad. That would help some. You could define some of these things as local closures, like right above the call site and then use them so that you, you know, avoid sort of this nesting. I personally, I thought this was the most aesthetically pleasing one, which may be a little scary. Um, the, the problem with the, like, if you're defining these as separate functions is you go back to the problem I was talking about before where the code for handling this is now spread out a bunch across a bunch of different places. You can do it in local variables, like local closure variables, but then you end up sort of defining things in the reverse order of how they're going to be called, and that looked weird to me, too. Some people might prefer that, though. Any questions? Right, thank you. <laughs>